Alhamdulillahi wa kafa Wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi Al-lazina astafa Khususan ala afdalihim Wa khatamin nabiyin Muhammadin al-amin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa ba'd We begin with Allah's blessed name The one God The only God Beside whom there is no other God. We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and our father Adam and our father Abraham and Moses and Jesus and on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad <coughs> sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, as we greet you from Ilford in London on this, the sixth day of the month of Zulqa'ala with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today is a uh, especially happy day for me. Uh, first of all, is because I left uh, Trinidad on the 3rd of May, uh, which was the first, the second day of Shawwal, uh, the day after Eid al-Fitr. And I flew to London, I arrived on the 4th, and I began this lecture tour on the 5th with an interview. Owais was the one who interviewed me on the 5th. And from the 5th of May, for more than one month now, I have been lecturing constantly, traveling all over Britain, while facing one of the fiercest, bitterest, and most wicked attack ever launched upon me in my life. And the purposes of that attack was to sabotage this lecture tour, to stop me. And today, thanks to Allah, the caravan has kept on moving, even while the dogs were barking. And I make no apologies for using this, this uh, um, expression. And today, the caravan has reached the last lecture. And even this lecture, they have not been able to stop it. So we begin by thanking Allah, who in his kindness allowed me to, to, to offer this humble service in the cause of teaching the Quran in, this, in, in Britain. We praise him and we thank him for what he had done for us and we pray that he may continue to help me as I now travel on from Britain to Rotterdam in Netherlands and then to Brussels in Belgium and then to Yerevan in Armenia and then to several cities in Switzerland and then to Athens and Thessaloniki in Greece and then to Tirana and Durus in uh, Albania and then to Skopje in uh, northern Macedonia before returning uh, to London late in August on my way back to Trinidad. Uh, and we also, I'm very happy today because my daughter is here with us today uh, for this lecture and my son-in-law who is somewhere in the back there. It's not often that I have my daughter and my son-in-law uh, in a lecture. And today's topic is not a difficult one. All that you need to do is to think. But I'm conscious of the fact that many people have stopped thinking now. And they allow others to think for them. <laughs> Our topic is room. Room in the Quran. And the word room is an Arabic word. It is pronounced like the room in a house. Room. And room in the Quran must not be confused with a, a city in Italy called Rome. If you make that mistake, I suggest you should go back to school. So then, who or what is room? 
The subject is of critical importance today. While we are on the verge of the great war, what our Prophet Allah's blessings be upon him describe as the Malhama. And in Christian and Jewish eschatology, it is referred to as Armageddon. And uh, our Prophet spoke about this great war that 99 of every 100, 99% of combatants in this war would be killed. So it won't be conventional warfare. For the first time in human history, you're going to, wait, you're going to witness a war waged universally with weapons of mass destruction. Some of which we already know, and others perhaps we will know only when the war takes place. Weapons of mass destruction. And Rome is at the heart of this great war. So who or what is Rome? If a subject is mentioned in the Quran, then proper methodology is that you must commence your study of the subject in the Quran. Does anyone differ with me? Having studied the subject in the Quran, you then go to study the subject in the Hadith. But if there is even the appearance of a conflict between what is in the Hadith and what is in the Quran, which one should prevail? Naturally, the Quran must prevail, not the Hadith. Okay? And so now let us go to the Quran. Is the word room located in the Quran? Oh, yes. A whole surah of the Quran is named after room. Surah to room. So that means <laughs> this is not a subject of passing importance. No. A whole surah is named Surah to Rome. And the surah begins with a reference to the name Rome. And so therefore, we have to commence our study of the subject of Rome with the Quran. Is this so difficult to understand? Well, then how do we explain that I have been teaching this subject for so long and yet cannot convince so many who begin the subject, the study of the subject in the Hadith and they remain there? How, what can we do with such people who refuse to turn to the Quran? as a first source of knowledge. The Quran begins by declaring after A'uzu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajim Alif Lam Mim It then goes on to say Guli Bati Rum Rum has been defeated Fiatna Al Ard Defeated in a land close by. This defeat took place at the time when the Quran was being revealed. And this defeat took place in a land close to where the Quran was revealed, in Arabia. So can Rome qualify as Washington? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> was was the United States of America even born at that time? <coughs> Can Rome qualify as Britain or France or Germany? Any part of the West? Was France or Britain or German, Germany, were they ever defeated? At that time? In a land close by? So Rome could not be the West. So who was Rome? 
who was defeated in a land close by. وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ But the Qur'an was revealed to deliver a prophecy, a divine prophecy, that yes, Rome was defeated, but في بدع السنين, in just a few years' time, Rome will be victorious. So then who was it? who was defeated and then was victorious shortly after the revelation of the Quran. Answer, there is no other answer. There's only one answer, only one that's correct. But it's a bitter answer for some people. They can't stomach the answer. They prefer to betray the Qur'an rather than to accept the truth. And so we say to them, do what you want, the truth will prevail. You can't stop this caravan. Rome was Constantinople. Rome was the holy... Orthodox Christian, Eastern Christian, Byzantine Empire. And uh, the Persian Empire defeated Byzantium. And within a few years, this prophecy was fulfilled. And uh, the Byzantine Empire turned the tables on the Persian Empire and defeated them. And so a divine prophecy was fulfilled in the Quran. There is an interesting anecdote pertaining to this event. That the Arabs in Mecca, who were worshipping the idols in the Kaaba, they identified with Persia because Persia was worshipping fire. This is not... Uh, an uncharitable statement is the truth. And the, the Muslims in Mecca were identifying with the Christian Empire, the Byzantine Empire, because there was so much in common between us and them. So when Persia defeated the Byzantine Empire. Mecca was celebrating <laughs> and throwing, throwing um, uh, harsh words against us, mocking us that our people were defeated and their people were victorious. So when Allah sent down this surah, it was like a thunderstorm. It rocked Mecca. Because the Quran was saying, yes, they were defeated, but within a few years they'll be victorious. Mecca refused to believe that. And so one of them challenged Abu Bakr Siddiq the companion of the Prophet, let's take a bet. Let's take a bet whether this prophecy will be fulfilled or not, that within a few years, Rome would be victorious. So Abu Bakr Siddiq is ready for the bet. <laughs> and uh, then the Prophet, when he heard that the bet was made, he said to Abu Bakr Siddiq, change the bet. Change the bet. Why? He said, Fi bid'i sinin means between three and nine years. So change the bet that Rome will be victorious within three to nine years. So Abu Bakr changed the debt, it modified the debt. The bet, and within the three to nine years, yes indeed. 
Rome was victorious. But Allah went on to say, Min qabl wa min ba'd that Rome would be victorious twice. The first victory, of course, took place before our very eyes. But when will the second victory come? Rome has not been victorious since then. And why does the Quran use the term before and after? We come back to that in a moment, insha'Allah. And then the verse goes on to say, But on that day, when Rome is victorious, when the holy, orthodox, Byzantine Christian Empire is victorious, when our Christian brothers are victorious, we will celebrate. There are Muslims in the world today who like a bone in their throat. They cannot accept it. They cannot accept that I can use the word brother for a Christian. They cannot accept it that the Quran is saying that the Muslims will celebrate on that day when the Christians are victorious. Because they have an eternal hatred in their hearts for Christians. An unalterable hatred. A sort of a imperishable hatred. A hatred which consumes everything. And they declare of all Christians that they're all disbelievers, kuffar, and they're all going into the hellfire. That is their standard recipe. <laughs> yes, for the subject of Christians. So they're not going to be pleased with this lecture at all. But before we turn to answer the question, min qabl wa min bad, two victories. The first victory occurs before. Before what? Before what? And the second victory occurs after. After what? Well, for those who think they have to seek to answer the question, before what and after what, there's something in between. The two victories, something in between which we have to locate by virtue of thinking and research. But before we answer that question, before what and after what, why do I refer to the Christian Byzantine Empire as the holy Christian Byzantine Empire? Why, I do, why do I use the word holy? The answer is that Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam, the Prophet Solomon, inherited the holy state of Israel from his father. Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, the Prophet David. And it was Allah himself who appointed David to rule in Jerusalem. Ya Dawood. This is the Quran. O David, Inna Jaalaka Khalifatan fil up. We hereby appoint you as ruler to rule on earth. So this is a holy state. This is a Khilafah state. Khilafah state and holy state are synonymous. And the state which was established by Nabi Dawood David was Holy Israel. And Jerusalem was the capital. 
And this was the promise of what was said to the angels on the first page of history. When Allah said to the angels, I'm going to place on earth one who will be Khalifa, one who would rule. And that promise was fulfilled when David was appointed to rule. The definition of a holy state, the definition of a Khilafah state, is that it is built on truth. And truth never comes from Washington. <laughs> no, truth comes from the Lord God. It most certainly doesn't come from the New York Times and from CNN. Even an American president would say about CNN is fake news. <laughs> Truth comes from Allah. So be, the foundation of the state must be the truth which has come from Allah. The system of government, governance must be based on the truth which has come from the Lord God. The law which must be established must be the sacred law which has come from the Lord God. And that law says that if you steal, not a mango, we wouldn't cut off your hand for that. But if you steal something of certain value, the hand must be cut off. Why? Because the Lord God recognizes that there is that punishment which is retributive. And there is that punishment which is reformatory. But there is also that punishment which is a deterrent. You punish someone to defer, deter others from committing that crime. And one of the punishments that are deterrent punishments is to cut off the hand of the thief. If you do that, there will be lots of investment bankers in Manhattan will be walking around with all hands. <laughs> not, not to talk about other bankers around the world. Because theirs is a system of legalized theft. The banking system is a system of legalized theft. So if we enforce the sacred law, lots of bankers will lose their hands. <laughs> this was the holy state. But when Suleiman alayhi salam saw the vision, and we don't have the time to explain the vision to you now, but at the book you'll find, at the back you'll find a book on the subject of the vision, the jasad, there's a book on the back on the jasad. Sitting on his throne, of course it was Dajjal, the Antichrist. So he recognized that the Antichrist wanted to usurp my kingdom, to rule over holy Israel so that he can declare, I am the Messiah, and al Masih. Whereas, no, he is not the Messiah, he is a liar. The true Messiah is the son of the Virgin Mary. So Suleiman alayhi salam, the Prophet Solomon, then responded to this vision with a dua or a prayer asking Allah, to grant that none should inherit my kingdom after me and that there should never ever be another kingdom comparable to mine. And so said, so done, and holy Israel collapsed after he died. And holy Israel could never be restored, could never be restored despite all the efforts made. Until today, we have Dajjal restoring a holy state of Israel in Jerusalem. When the Messiah did come, some of them recognized him as the Messiah. 
and they believed in him. But others rejected him. Why? They were tested and they failed the test. They said, when Billah min hadha, his mother was not married. And so he's a bastard. And the bastard can't be the Messiah. This is one of the reasons why they rejected him. There's several other reasons. So when they saw him crucified before their very eyes, and if I, Imran, was there, I would also be convinced that he was crucified because Allah made it appear like that. When they saw him crucified before their very eyes, some of them were weeping while others were celebrating. Allah then expelled them all from Jerusalem. And then he destroyed Jerusalem, meaning the holy state of Israel. And he placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own until, until when? وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ They can never return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own. حَتَّى أُنْتِلْ إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ When Gog and Magog are released because Zulkarnain has, he has, checkmated them, he's built the barrier and they're behind the barrier. But when Allah brings down that barrier and they're released, then they will spread out all over it, all over the world. And Gog and Magog have power none can resist. None can resist, not even Saddam Hussein. And they use their power to oppress and they use their power to corrupt everything they touch, they corrupt. They corrupt the political system, they corrupt the economic system, they corrupt the monetary system, they corrupt the educational system, they corrupt the male-female relations, they corrupt the status and role of women in society, they corrupt entertainment and sports, they corrupt agriculture, they spoil, they corrupt water, they corrupt the atmosphere. Everything they touch, they corrupt. And so when they are released into the world, the world is going to witness a fierce storm, an evil storm growing through the world, blowing through the world. And it takes a servant of Allah with incredible courage and incredible insight and incredible eloquence to call them out. You are the devils yourselves. And that was Malcolm X. We, we don't produce we don't produce these kind of scholars of Maulanas and Mulvis who graduate from the institutions of Islamic learning. You could put a million of them, they can't weigh one, the weight of one Malcolm. Incredible courage, incredible insight, incredible eloquence, eloquence, yes. To declare this is Satan himself. This is a civilization with the word kafir written on his forehead. This is a one-time event in history. They were spread out all over the world. And then the Quran declared they will bring the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own. And now you have a state of Israel, a bogus state of Israel. That is their history. The ones who were celebrating when they saw him crucified. What about these who were weeping when they saw him crucified? These are believers. 
These are people who loved him and followed him. And Allah bless them. Allah bless them. To be able to conquer Constantinople without fighting. A city. Janibun minha fil bar. Wa janibun minha fil bar. One part of the city adjoins the land, and another part of the city is by the sea. And the people of Banu Ishaq land in this city, and they declare, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, three times, and the city falls to them without fighting. That's how Constantinople became a Christian city. There's no evidence of fighting. None. <laughs> exactly as mentioned in the Hadith. And so when Christians took over Constantinople and it became a Christian city, naturally, naturally, the longing in the heart of that Christian is to restore holy Israel, the Khilafah state. And that's why the Byzantine Empire is called the Holy Byzantine Empire. Because in the, it is an attempt by the Christian people who accepted Jesus as the Messiah to establish a holy state. Good. So this has to be something which wins Allah's pleasure <laughs> that you're attempting to build a holy state. Afghanistan wants to do that now. Afghanistan fought the Americans for 20 years and defeated them. And then they had to put their tail between their legs and flee from Afghanistan. And now Afghanistan longs to establish the holy state. Okay? They tried to do it 25 years ago, but they didn't. They had the capacity to fight, but they didn't have enough capacity to think. So they failed 25 years ago. And at this time, they're not as yet succeeding. So we also have this desire to build a holy state. Or first day, and that's what the Christian did in Constantinople. Now then, so Allah helped them, and they were successful, and they defeated Persia with Allah's help. The the verses continue to say, "Binasrillahi and surumayyasha," that they were successful because Allah helped them. Now then. Let us ask an important question. I hope no one has objections to my asking the question. This is a victory which occurred while our Prophet was still in Mecca, before the Hijra to Medina. That Byzantium was successful and they defeated Persia. My question is, were these Christians who received Allah's help and were victorious, were they a Christian people who believed in the Trinity? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What is the answer? What is the answer? The answer is that the Council of Nicaea had taken place about 300 years earlier. And the Christian world, led by the Holy Byzantine Empire, had already accepted the Trinity. 
and were worshipping Jesus as the Son of God. Is there anyone who wants to challenge me on this? Is there anyone who differs with me on this? That the Christians in the Holy Byzantine Empire who defeated Persia and therefore fulfilled the divine promise or prophecy in Surah to Rome of the Quran were a Christian people who already accepted the Trinity and were already worshipping Jesus as the Son of God. No one is deferring with me. No one wish to challenge me. Not one. So yes, this is the truth. This is the truth. That despite the fact that the Quran rejects and uh, rejects with very strong language, Keburat, Kalimatan, Terrible are these words which emerge from them. That's the language used in the Quran for belief in the Trinity and worshipping Jesus as the Son of God and Mary as the Mother of God. Despite the strong language in the Quran, yet Allah in His wisdom helped them. And they were victorious. Despite the fact that they were worshipping Jesus as the Son of God, and they believed in the Trinity, we celebrated that victory. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَحْرَهُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The believers celebrated that victory, including Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him. So tell the schoolboys who have eternal hatred in their hearts for Christians and who declare that all Christians are going to end up in the hellfire. Tell him go back and study the Quran because your knowledge of the Quran is defective and insufficient. Good now. We return to Min Kabul. Woman bad. The room will be victorious twice. The context here is two victories for room. How then can we explain this mysterious view of some of the um, commentators of the Quran? Many of them, really, not some who declared that the second victory was not a victory of Rome. The second victory was the conquest of Mecca, when Muslims conquered Mecca. And our response is, no, sorry, you're wrong. The context here is two victories for Rome. And you cannot squeeze in this, this bogus explanation. So now then, why does Allah use the word before? Before what? And why does he use the word after? After what? The Quran doesn't give us the answer. We have to think. We have to search. And we have to locate the answer. I did that work myself. And I came to a conclusion. And I share it with you, but since it is my view, I always say, warn you, do not accept my view. Do not accept my view unless you are convinced that it is correct. Because I am not part and parcel of any brainwashing of people. I don't want to leave behind me robots who simply repeat everything I have said. I want to cultivate independent thinking. I want to cultivate critical thinking. So when you stand up tomorrow and I'm in my grave, you stand up powerfully 
because you have conviction in what you are saying. It's not hand-me-down knowledge. <laughs> it's not a package called knowledge which has to be transferred from one generation to another. That is not the process of the transfer of knowledge. Knowledge must always be transferred in a manner which fosters and encourages critical thinking, independent thinking. That's the way my teacher taught me. And that's the way I teach you. So then, why before and why after? When I look at the history of Rome, I'm, all, I'm able to locate something in between before and after, which is of paramount, paramount, supreme importance. It is the breakup of Rome into two parts. Rome broke up into two parts in the year 1054. One part remained in Constantinople and the other part went to the West and established what became known as Western Christianity. There are two events, one recorded in the Quran and one located in history, which explain the breakup of Rome. Let us take the one located in the Quran first. And you'll find this analysis in my book at the back entitled Constantinople in the Quran. I've referred to two books so far. The first one is the book on the Jasad. And the second one is Constantinople in the Quran. That in Surah Al-Araf, which is the surah that you have to recite today, your juice for today is Ara. And somewhere around verse 166, I believe, where well, yes, was Alhum, this hearing aid is the, 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 the wire is not long enough. They have to change it to give me a longer wire. So we put it aside for the time being. It can be a trouble. Was Alhum Anil Qadiyati Leti Kanat Hadirat al Question them about the town located by the sea. And in that town are a people who are obliged to obey the law of the Torah. And the law of the Torah has given you the law of the Sabbath. That on the seventh day of the week, the Israelite people are prohibited from working. They have to pray and they have to rest, but they cannot work. If you cannot work, it means you cannot fish. But this is a town which lives by fishing. It's Constantinople. It's Constantinople. So what Allah did was for every day of the week, no fish. You can fish and fish and fish. You'll not catch a single fish. But on the Sabbath day, he sends all the fish. But they're not allowed to fish. On the Sabbath day, this is the mother of all tests and trials. Will they be faithful to the law? Obey the law and refrain from fishing? Or will they abandon the law and go and fish? That's what some of them did. They went fishing on the Sabbath day, despite the fact that the others were warning them. And yet others were saying, you're wasting your time to warn them. They'll never change. Allah then cursed 
those who went fishing. And he said, Kunu kiladatan khasein, be apes, despise. And these are the people who left Constantinople and came to create Western Christianity. Many Christians in the West don't know this. <laughs> we have to tell them that this is a civilization cursed by the Lord God himself. And this is a civilization which is destined to eventually live like monkeys. So modern Western civilization would eventually become monkey town. Except when I went to Pakistan, they told me Bandarabad. Monkeys don't wear clothing, but there's nothing despicable about that. That's their way of life. This is a civilization which, which will show a preference for increasing nudity. And for a human being to take off their clothing and to show a preference for nudity is something shameful and despicable. This the the monkey does not the monkey does his bedroom life in public. But there's nothing shameful and despicable about that. That's his way of life. But this is a civilization which will show eventually a preference for sexual relations in public. And that is shameful and that is despicable. And so that part of Rome, which was cursed by the Lord God, came over on this side to become modern Western secular godless civilization. That's the first explanation. But then there's a second one. And that's the one to which we now return to tell you what is it before and what is it after. And that is in 1054, 1054, the final straw that broke the camel back took place. And the West broke away from Constantinople over a special issue. Constantinople was consistently declaring that is the Orthodox Christian world that the Holy Spirit proceeds only from the Father and not from the Son. Giving a priority to God the Father over God the Son. God the Father is the supreme being, not God the Son. Because the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and not from the Son. Western Christianity said no. The Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son, which is unadulterated shirk. And this was the cause of the breakup. So we have abandoning the law. We don't care two peanuts for the law anymore. We go and go fishing. And they've been fishing, fishing ever since. And secondly, unadulterated shirk. The Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. So the Father and the Son have equal status. So this is what made the difference. And this explains the word before and after. Now we're 1054. 40 years later, a pope in Rome launched the Crusades. 
Just 40 years later, the first crusades were launched by Western Christianity to conquer Jerusalem. But the crusades were not meant to simply conquer Jerusalem. They launched the crusades to conquer Constantinople as well. Because they wanted Constantinople to submit to them and their Christian belief that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. And then came the second and the third and the fourth crusades. And then eventually the emergence of modern Western civilization. This is room in the Quran. And all that now remains of the subject of room in the Quran is when will the second victory occur? Because room will be victorious twice. And on both occasions, we Muslims will celebrate, not those who are waging their bogus jihad in Syria and who hate me so much they wish I could simply disappear or evaporate. <laughs> but <laughs> tell them the truth will survive. You can kill a man, but you cannot kill the truth. This caravan will keep on moving, inshallah, even though the dogs keep on barking. When will the second victory come? I don't have the time in today's lecture to take you on to another huge subject of the Melhama. But yes, I am of the view that Rome will be victorious in the Melhama. Rome is no longer Constantinople because the Jal used the Ottoman Empire to wage war in Constantinople. Dajjal used the Ottoman Empire to wage war on Constantinople, to sabotage what was prophesied in the Quran. And so Rum left Constantinople and went to Moscow. And it is Russia which today leads Rum. And this explains their eternal hatred for Russia. Oh, the hatred they have for Russia is indescribable. Because Russia defeated them in Syria. <laughs> and so my view is that the second victory for Rome is coming in the Great War around the corner. Yes, Russia will be badly um, badly um, damaged, and so to China. But the bottom line is that the Western world will be defeated because Allah will punish them. And this is in Surah Al Rahman of the Quran. And now uh, let me remember, repeat, let me give you the name of a third book, and this is a very small one the Quran, the Great War, and the West. And in that book, the Quran, the Great War, and the West, I have quoted from Surah to Rahman to explain why Allah has repeated one verse in the Quran. How many times? 31, 31. 31 times. Did you hear that? <laughs> 31 times. Indicating to us knocking on the door of the mind 31 times that in this surah there is something of extremely great importance. Sanafrugu lakum ayyuhath thakalan is the critical verse of the Quran. I'm going to deal with both of you who are laden with sin. Hmm? That's modern Western civilization. And so the second victory of Rome is around the corner. But in between now, the first and the second victory, we have Gog and Magog entering into the picture. And we have the second of the two currents of Karnain, which was my lecture yesterday, which I can't repeat today. The second current of Karnain is that in which Gog and Magog are going to be checkmated 
for the second time. And that's going to happen in the region of the Black Sea and Crimea commands the Black Sea. But I'm only repeating what I did yesterday. <coughs> and so we have a coming together of two victories of Rome with the two currents of Karnain coming together in the Great War, which is about, about to take place. Now then, when we leave the Quran, or we go to the Hadith now, then we find the confusion. <laughs> because the Hadith sometimes refers to that part of Rome which broke away and went to the West and was cursed by the Lord God. The Hadith sometimes refer to that part as Rome when they say Rome will land in the north of Syria. See? So if you do not have the capacity to distinguish between room which is favored by Allah and room which is cursed by Allah, you'll not be able to make any headway in understanding the hadith. But I think I've spoken enough for you. And your homework is now to go to the hadith and look for all the references to room and separate that room which is blessed by Allah from that room which is cursed by Allah. And this, with this we will end today's talk and we finally have to thank Allah once again that although we've had a long time for this month, more than a month of travel in Britain, and despite all the efforts made to stop this caravan from moving, praise and thanks be to Allah, the caravan kept on moving until today, the last lecture, and praise is due to Allah. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone, anyone has any other questions, please bring them forward, please. We do it in a cell where we write them down here. So it's so beautiful. If you can just follow what everyone else is doing here, write down your question. What you did with hearing it? They're going to get me the longer wire soon, so it won't be coming out. Inshallah. Okay, where are your questions? No questions so far. Thank you. Anyone ready? So the first question is, uh, what will be China, India, and Pakistan's role, either with or without Russia? The road forward for Pakistan is quite plain and clear for those who still have the capacity to think. But of course, there are Pakistanis who no longer think, including some Maulanas as well. <laughs> The road forward for Pakistan is to build the same relationship with Russia that Pakistan has with China. That is the road forward. The previous government of Imran Khan was moving in that direction. And uh, the Western world didn't like that. The Western world has pledged that Pakistan must never have the freedom to choose its own rulers. We will choose your rulers for you. You must forever remain our slaves, Pakistan. And that's why the West was definitely part and parcel of the effort to, 
bring about regime change in Pakistan. The road forward for Pakistan is for the people of Pakistan to rise up. To rise up. And let me say it plain and clear. Rise up and tell the chief of staff of the Pakistan Armed Forces, get lost. Get lost. General, get lost. You are not going to determine the foreign policy of this country. We will determine. We pay your salary. You are not our, our ruler. We didn't choose you to rule this country. Tell the chief of staff of the Pakistan Armed Forces, get lost. Of course, I can't return to Pakistan now. They'll do an Adnan Khashoggi on me. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm outside of Pakistan, I can speak. And the Pakistani people are going to love it. Oh, yes. That's the road forward to Pakistan. Tell the present rulers of Pakistan, you're betraying this country, you professional politicians. You only have the power. But you have to put Pakistan first and set the example for the rest of the world of Islam that this country needs the freedom with which to choose its future. And this is the future for Pakistan to build with Russia the same relationship that you have with China. This is only part of the subject of the, fu the future for Pakistan. As for uh, the rest of the question, what is the role of China? Uh, yes, what would be China's role? China was, is led by one part of the Communist Party. And the Soviet Union was led by another part, and these two were in conflict with each other. But that was a stage-managed conflict. <laughs> it was meant to throw dust in the eyes of the West, and it succeeded magnificently in doing so. And the, the West was taken by surprise. As soon as the Soviet Union folded its tent and disappeared into the darkness of the night, China was the first to observe and recognize that the new Russia, which was replacing the Soviet Union, was an Orthodox Christian Russia, and therefore a Russia that China could trust, and a Russia with which China could build fraternal relations and alliance. No Muslim country saw it, none. None of the scholars of Islam saw it, but the Chinese saw it. And the Chinese moved swiftly. And they established that fraternal relationship with Russia. And they have now established the Russian-Chinese alliance. And this is the first alliance in history to stand up with a credible capacity to resist Western oppression. There is a second alliance coming to add to the first one. And that's the alliance for which I work and I'm traveling. The alliance between the world of Islam and the Orthodox Christian world. And so China is on the right path in building its alliance with Russia. And that alliance between China and Russia is going to take that alliance to victory in the Great War. Uh, yeah, the next question is, why is there hatred between Muslims and Christians? Is it because of teachings from certain places? The hatred <coughs> for Christians amongst Muslims is something which has been engineered by Al-Masihu Dajjal. He's taken them for a ride. They have been brainwashed to such an extent that they are now rejecting the Quran itself. These brainwashed Christian Muslims. That Allah says in the Quran 
that at that time when the Jews would become the most hostile of all forces to you, at that time there will be a Christian people who will be closest in love and affection for you. Today the Jews are the most hostile of all. Ask Gaza, ask Palestine and they'll tell you. Like a concentration camp, relentless oppression from Jewish Israel. And at that time when this is taking place, guess what Russia has just done? Russia has passed a law. Anyone who shows disrespect for Islam in Russia will be arrested. But the sheep and the cattle and the goats and the camels have their hearts polluted and corrupted with eternal hatred so they can't think anymore. And they're betraying the word of Allah in the Quran. What can you do for such people who are destined for divine destruction? Um, yeah, the next question is about Hitra. Uh, what, what is your opinion on Philippines, Indonesia, and timing for Hitra? Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand. No, sorry, and the timing. When is a good time? When's a good time? It's already too late. <laughs> I have been telling you for so long <laughs> to make Hitra. So long? You're already too late? <laughs> you should have gone already? And there are so many who have already gone. Oh, yes. So many who have already gone, and they, re they write to me and they tell me about their experiences and so on. If you have not left already, you should leave as soon as you can. Do not delay. There are two kinds of hearts. There is that heart which is comfortable in Britain and will only when, the only time you will want to leave is when you see there is no escape. No way, I have to get out. But your heart was comfortable all the time. So when you want to leave, Allah will block you. Yes, that's a risk that you pray. And there is that heart which is uncomfortable, restless in this country. How can I live in a country where a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate? How can I live in a country where all the wealth of the world has come dripping with the blood of the poor and the destitute? Bangladesh is miserably poor. Pakistan is miserably poor. Indonesia is miserably poor. Our people are suffering so much and you have stolen all that wealth through legalized theft. And I have to live amongst you and enjoy because the poor sterling pound is so strong. If your heart is comfortable here, then you will not be able to leave when you want to leave. But if your heart is uncomfortable, I wish to go, I wish to, I don't want to stay here then Allah can help you to leave. So you should have left already. Uh, and uh, it may be that tomorrow it might be too late. Could the event of Gog and Magog have happened in 1917? And could 31 mean something, else, something special in regard to this? I didn't hear the first question. Could the event of Yajuj Majuj have happened in 1917. The event of Yajuj and Majuj, located in the Quran, is when the barrier is brought down and Gog and Magog are released into the world. And that didn't happen in 1914. That happened in the lifetime of our Prophet. He was sleeping with his wife Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and he woke from sleep and his face was flushed red. 
he had seen something in his sleep which was terrible. And he said, Wailul Arabin Sharrin Kadiktarawa. Woe unto the Arabs because of an evil which is now close. And then he raised his hands like this and he said, Today a hole has been made in the barrier built by Zulkarnain. And so the, the beginning of the demolition of that barrier began on that day when the Prophet ﷺ had that vision. So Gog and Magog were released into the world long, long years ago in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And when they are released into the world, eventually they will acquire such power that they will spread out all over the world and take control of the world in an, in an event which will occur only once in history. So if you can't see that, you should go to the specialist, have your eyes examined. Or go to the psychiatrist and have your head examined. An event to occur only once in history. A people with indestructible power. And they use their power to oppress. And they use their power to corrupt. And they spread out all over the world and they take control of power in the world. And then they bring the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own after 2,000 years. And you can't see that. <laughs> Something is wrong. So the release of Gog and Magog did not take place in 1917. What happened in 1917 is that Britain issued the Balfour Declaration. And a British army conquered Jerusalem from the Ottoman Empire. And a British general declared today the Crusades have ended. And the League of Nations conferred on Britain what they call a mandate to rule over the Holy Land, which continued from 1917 until 1948. Is the second victory by the Orthodox Christians yeah, is the second victory by the Orthodox Christians, if so, if so, will they live in harmony with Muslims? Who will rule them? Please clarify this point. The second victory is around the corner. I said it's going to be in the Great War. But this is only my opinion. I can be wrong. Will the Orthodox Christians be willing to live in harmony with Muslims? It's already happening. It's already happening. I went to Belgrade. The Ottomans ruled over Belgrade for 400 years. And when the Serbs were able to throw them out, they destroyed every single masjid in Belgrade. They left only one masjid standing. Everything else was destroyed. The hatred for Islam was indescribable because the only Islam they knew was Ottoman Islam. And I went to Belgrade twice. And I lectured in the University of Bel Belgrade in the large auditorium. And because they were listening to me on the internet and they knew what I was saying about the Quran and the Orthodox Christians, that something happened when I entered the hall that never happened before in my life. These people are seeing me for the first time. 99% of all those in the hall are Christians. Hardly 1% Muslims. And that entire hall packed with people stood up applauding me for about five minutes when I entered the hall. I never experienced this before in my life. No one in the world. And when I was lecturing in, the, in that auditorium, they were crying. They were crying. And they're welcoming me now anyway in the Orthodox Christian world. I go there welcoming me. I'm going now to Armenia. 
I'm going to Greece, I'm going to um, Northern Macedonia, Albania, and so on. So the friendship between Muslims and Christians, the Orthodox Christian world, is already taking place. And Russia has now simply recently declared the law. Anyone who disrespects Islam in Russia will be arrested. But in France, you could mock the prophet. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's freedom of expression in France. Not in Russia, yes? Uh, Yusuf, uh, an 11-year-old, yeah, he says, Assalamu alaikum. Do you have any advice for Muslim children in this country, please? This is a very dangerous country for Muslim children. Very dangerous country. And if you're a Muslim child and your heart has not already been seduced by this country, you're lucky. Because children are more likely to fall in love with this country. And when Papa wants to leave, Mama will say, you can go, we're staying. And the children will say, Papa, you can go, but we are staying. It's too late now. The child has taken away your children from you. So if you are a Muslim child, tell your parents, I want to leave. Is there no chance for justice to be established in the West? So long as Gog and Magog control power in the Western world, the West will continue to be moving towards monkey town, meaning a life of increasing decadence, increasing injustice, increasing oppression. Yes. Uh, it looks like it's the last question. Okay. okay. Um, what's the future for Muslims in India as looking at the situation of today? I, uh, my first lecture that I delivered was uh, the way forward for India's Muslims here in London, right here in this hall. The response to that lecture was that many people deferred with me <laughs> on my analysis because they have this feeling that Hinduism Hinduism is a nasty religion. The Hindu religion belongs to the gutter. And you must not miss, you must not say anything good about the Hindu religion. And between Hindus and Muslims there's eternal hatred and internal warfare. That's their view. But I did not do that. <laughs> I spoke about two kinds of Hindus, like there are two kinds of Christians and two kinds of Jews. The present government of, of India is a government to be condemned. It is a warmongering government. It is a government with people who have hatred in their hearts for Islam. And they want that hatred to prevail all over India. That is the government, the governing party. And I have never spoken one good word about them, except that they have shown great um, wisdom. And they've shown great courage in standing up for Russia, in Russia's conflict with Ukraine. And they have not, they have not allowed the West to trample upon them. They say, we will continue buying Russian oil. You can't stop us. So even the former Prime Minister of Pakistan is praising India for India's policies pertaining to Russia. But apart from this very good foreign policy of the Indian government, the rest of us is that it's a warmongering government when Pakistan is concerned. And uh, I have offered my views for the future of India's Muslims in the first lecture I delivered here. And I don't have anything more to say on the subject at this time. Okay. Uh, will the Jasad be referred to as the Jah, ruled from the Third Temple or from Al Aqsa Mosque? The temple built by Suleiman alayhi salam 
is on the same spot where Alexa Masjid now exists. So Alexa Masjid will have to go so that the Jal can rebuild the temple. How will Alaksa Masjid go? And when will it go? I think that's the very last thing that the Jal will want to do because you touch that, you're touching fire. And it's most likely that he will have to use a convenient earthquake having destabilized the foundations of the building, that a moderate earthquake will bring it crumbling down. And there are many more ways than one to have a, an earthquake. The Arabs are led by traitors, like Pakistan today. All the governments in the world of Islam are like that. But your government may be establishing ties with Israel, but that doesn't mean that the people are supporting the government. The majority of Pakistani people today are supporting the previous government. They're not supporting the present government. Okay? But uh, Dajjal uses his own tricks to bring about regime change. He takes control of a government and he takes control of the armed forces as he's done in Pakistan. And then he uses the armed forces and he uses the government to control the masses. But Iran showed the way that if the people want, they can remove a government, no matter how powerful it is, and they could send the armed forces into the garbage bin. Tell that to the chief of staff of the Pakistan armed forces. The government, the people of Pakistan can do that to you. Okay, all right. Okay, so the books are at the back. And uh, if you want me to autograph your book and put your name, would you kindly write your name for me on a piece of paper? So I don't have to ask you what is your name, okay? You can go now and get the books and come to me for autographing. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.